Great. Thanks everyone for coming today. Uh, we're gonna kick off uh, the meeting. Uh, just, we have a lot to cover as per usual. So <laughs> we're gonna kick off the meeting with um, just some quick updates. So uh, I believe uh, Katie Cohen is replacing Morgan Belts from the Organs and Business, Organ and Business Industries. Uh, and we have James Schroeder, who's the new interim Oregon Health Authority Director, who will be joining us at our March meeting. He's unable to come today. I think many of us on this call understand starting a brand new job and then <laughs> coming to the board meeting. So looking forward to um, having James join us. So we're going to do a quick round of introductions. Um, and I, if people could say their name, their organization, and the name of your pet, if you have one, <laughs> as we go around. So, um, I'm Felisa Higgins. Um, my name, uh, I work at SEIU. My pronouns are she, her, they, them. And my pet's name is Rascal. She's a dog. Let's, and I'll call on Peter. Hi, I'm Peter Davidson. I work for Pacific Source Health Plans, and uh, my five-year-old golden retriever is named Kona. Do you want to, Peter? Do you want to pick the next person? Oh, let's go, Katie. <laughs> Hi, I'm Katie Koenig. I'm with OBI. And I have two dogs, Xena and Trixie. Let's go, Greg. <laughs> Hi, I'm Greg Sutliff. I'm from Project Access Now, and my pronouns are they, them, theirs. And uh, I have a cat named Voltio. Okay, Jim. Um, my name is Jim Hauser, Main Street Alliance. I have a seven-year-old rat terrier named Luna, and I'll pick Shannon Salvador. <laughs> Hi, I'm Shannon Saldivar. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I own Saldivar Insurance and the Dows, and I have two dogs, Shadow and Banjo, and a fish named Spike. <laughs> um, I will pick Gil. Hi, good, good morning. Gil Munoz, uh, Virginia Garcia Health Center. Um, he, him uh, pronouns um, currently don't have a, a, a pet. Uh, and how about uh, Teresa? She hasn't gone. Uh, Teresa Learn with Care Oregon. Uh, we don't have a pet either. We lost our cat named Bliss a while ago, and I'm trying to convince my husband to get another cat. So. <laughs> uh, boy, uh, how about Michael Anderson? Hey, good morning, all. Uh, my name is Michael Anderson Athey. I uh, use he, him, his pronouns. I'm an independent consultant, so I do, uh, do my own business, and I have three animals. I have two dogs, uh, Nora and Greta, and then I have a cat named Clover. Um, how about Hurdesh? Hi, I'm Hurdesh and uh, with Kaiser Permanente in the reimbursement department. I don't have a pet, but uh, my daughter does, and it, it, but they, but. It's really our pet. She had the cat. The cat named Huey has not seen my daughter for about two weeks now, so it's our cat. <laughs> Andrew, thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Andrew Stolfi. I use he/him pronouns. I'm the director of the State Department of Consumer and Business Services and the State Insurance Commissioner. And we have a beautiful six-year-old mutt named Nova, and four fish named George, 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 and Sunny. And uh, turn it over to Mary Beth. Good morning, I'm Mary Beth Garino. I use she, her pronouns. I'm the healthcare advocate at Osberg, and I do not have any pets here in Oregon, but I left when I moved out here, uh, my dog Gwen, uh, who is a nine-year-old uh, Pyrenees mutt with my parents. Um, and I will call on Bill. Have you gone yet? 
Hi, I'm Bill Barcelona. And I'm with America's Physician Groups. We have two cats, Salas and Rosie. They're 13 years old. Let's go, Angela. Hey, good morning, everybody. I'm Angela Dowling with Regions Blue Cross Blue Shield. Um, I have too many pets to name here. Uh, I have a farm that uh, my family operates, so I'll stick with the traditional as opposed to going through. Once I hit 20 in my head, I was like, I can't go through all of those, but uh, we have a dog named Daisy and three cats, Luna, Pepper, Garth, and a whole bunch of other animals, but we'll leave it there. Uh, Julie. Julie Weller, uh, Intel. Uh, I have a German Shepherd named Addie and a Golden Doodle named Zuri. Uh, let's go, Gerond. Hi, I'm Gerondi, and I actually don't have any pets. I have a three year old son, but no pets. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Michael? Well, if it's me, I already went. So oh, Michael Gay. Okay. Oh, good morning. Uh, Michael Gay with uh, Salem Health. And uh, I have three cats, Pippin, Barb, and Bev. Uh, Stacy DeLong. Hello, my name is Stacy DeLong. I work with Oregon Health Authority. My pronouns are she or they. I have two cats named Sunny and Pickle. Uh, who am I missing here? Trevor Douglas? Trevor Douglas, he, him, pronouns, director of the OHA Pharmacy Purchasing Policy and Programs section in HPA. Trevor, do you have any pets? <laughs> I have too many to name, but my two dogs, Maverick and Mocha. Nice. Uh, Stefan. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, um, I finally figured out how to um, start my video. So here yeah. um, I'm Stefan and I'm a, a health economist at uh, CHSE Center for Health Systems Effectiveness at OHSU. Um, we have, I, I would say it this way, we have a cat that lives with us. Um, I don't think she would say that she's our pet. <laughs> <laughs> I should have rephrased the question. How many people have animals that own them? Jason. <laughs> Yeah, good morning. Uh, Jason Hawkins, administrator over at Peace Harbor in Florence, Oregon, on the coast. Um, two cats, two orange tabbies, uh, Maya and Dre, are our two animals that raise us. Perfect. And my screen, my screen is frozen, so now I can't go to the second screen. So Sarah, can you help me out? I think we've got all committee members at this point. Um, other presenters, we have Ashley. Oh, hello everyone. I'm Ashley Thurstrup, uh, she, her pronouns, and I'm the Interim Government Relations Director here at OHA. Nice to be here with you today. And Phil Schmidt. Hi all, Philip Schmidt, he, him pronouns, and I uh, work uh, with Ashley on the OHA government relations team. Yeah. Thank you for having us today. And Trilby. Good morning, I'm Trilby DeYoung, she, her pronouns. I'm the deputy director for health policy and analytics. Happy to be um, joining, listening to the meeting this morning. Three cats, Neo, George, and Huck all COVID adoptees. Okay, Felicia, do you wanna keep going through other attendees? Yeah, do we have all committee members? We have all committee members, I think. Okay, great. Uh, let's jump into the agenda. <laughs> unless someone is dying to share their pet. <laughs> okay. Uh, so thanks again, everyone for coming. So I think, um, did people have a chance to look at the notes from the November meeting?
Okay. <laughs> um, I'm just going to go through. So today we're going to talk about a work plan for uh, the work that we're going to come that we have on our plates for 2023. Uh, we'll get an update from the staff about the legislative session, talk about the cost growth target. Um, shocking. I assume that that's why you're all here today. <laughs> and uh, we're going to talk about the prescription drug affordability report. We'll have public comment at 1145 today. Uh, do you want to go to the next slide, Sarah? Great. So I think um, just to remind folks about our group agreements, um, as always, we're in a new year. And so it's a good just check in on what we've committed to do with each other uh, and in this space today. Um, I also would like to remind people in this meeting, I am having a doing my best with multiple screens. <laughs> um, if people could use the hand raise function, I think that that's really helpful because you pop to the top of the list and so you can kind of see who's going on. So to use the hand raise function at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you have a little smiley face and underneath it, it has a plus sign that says reactions. And then next to that is a little arrow pointing up and you can see at the bottom, if you do one click on that little man or that little smiley face, it'll say raise hand and that's how you'll pop to the top of the queue and that will allow us to keep track of who's jumping in and how we're talking and that way everybody can participate and it definitely will help me and Peter facilitate the meeting in a much more equitable way so um, I encourage people to step in um, and ask questions and engage I also want to remind people that we not everybody engages in the same way and so we want to leave space for people who may not be the first person to raise their hand, who may not be the first person out there to jump in so that we can hear from everybody um, and have a meeting um, moving forward where every voice is heard and treated well. Next slide. Okay. I'm going to turn it back to Sarah to talk. I believe I'm turning it back to Sarah to talk about our work plan. Yeah, thank you. We're going to talk a little bit about logistics and some updates for what the year's work looks like. I know we shared a draft work plan and meeting schedule in November, but as we're getting into the new year, things are settling a little bit. So I wanted to share some updates and just give everyone a preview of what we are going to be doing together this year. Next slide, please. So a um, couple of key activities that the program will be doing this year. Um, in the spring, late April, early May, um, public reporting at the payer and provider organization level begins. This will be the first time we report payer and provider organization level performance relative to the cost growth target. No accountability, just public reporting. So that happens um, this spring. Related to that, we also intend to hold our first um, public hearing that talks about that um, uh, that talks about cost growth and focuses on payer provider market level cost growth. Um, so also likely in early May, we plan to do accountability rulemaking in the summer and fall, and then we expect to be having an ongoing conversation throughout this year of identification and selection of what our cost growth mitigation strategies are. If you all remember, we talked about this a lot last year and when we launched um, having a cost growth target, collecting all the data, having reporting to understand cost growth and cost growth drivers is all really great. And it is foundational to coming to take action, to, to identifying what those cost drivers are and then taking action or recommending things to do about them. Um, so we really wanna keep that focus on taking action this year and we'll be bringing strategies back to the committee um, throughout our meetings. Next. So just a quick overview of some of our meeting topics and where things have shifted around. Um, there's a lot of detail on here, um, subject to change, but just as a, as a heads up, um, places where we anticipate committee decisions are bolded on these couple of slides. So today we're going to talk about the target, we're going to talk about the Prescription Drug Affordability Board report, and we're going to continue strategies to address pharmacy costs. Um, that's our conversation that we were having last year. Um, in our March meeting, we will look at trends data for 18, 19, and 20. We will do some planning around the public report and public hearing. Maybe we'll start our conversation about accountability. 
In May, it will focus on the 2020 to 2021 cost trends data and that payer and provider organization level performance. We'll continue talking about cost growth mitigation strategies and what those opportunities might be. Um, have a placeholder here. There are a lot of questions that have come up about how the rate review process for insurers with the with DCBS works, Department of Consumer and Business Services, and how that relates or does not relate to the cost growth target. So we might want to bring that back and have a conversation about rate review and the cost growth target and where they connect and where they don't. Next slide. We originally um, had planned to talk about the value-based payment compact in the, um, early in the year and late in the year. So our, our semi-annual check-in um, after some updates and consultation with the staff working on the value-based payment compact work, we've moved that conversation to July and September. So in July, we'll have an update on um, the data, how we're doing on our progress towards those value-based payment targets. Um, we'll hear from the compact work group, and we'll also have a conversation about whether or not it's time to extend value-based payment compact targets. They're only set through 2024 at this point. So we'll hold that in a two-part conversation. We'll continue um, checking in on accountability, cost growth mitigation strategies, and in November we'll finalize recommendations on a report. So in our November meeting last year, our last meeting, we talked about um, whether or not we would do a recommendations report to sort of summarize all of our work throughout the year. You agreed that that would be a good plan. So that is what we're planning on doing. That report would have recommendations and whatever strategies um, the committee is going to come up with over the next year. That is our rough plan for the year. Again, some of these conversations might not be as neatly constrained to just one meeting. Um, there might be some carryover as new topics come up. This is definitely adjustable, but that's the current plan. Any questions or comments about the work plan? Okay, I'm not seeing. Yeah. <laughs> I'm also going to give people an opportunity that is mean to the staff, and I'm just going to be frank about that. Um, if you see something that you think is important and missing from this work plan as you have time to dig into it, please reach out to Sarah, Peter, or I so that we can make sure that we add it in. Um, uh, as we know, it's important for them to have lead time to prepare for these meetings, and this is a robust agenda, so it's kind of hard to ask people to do more but <laughs> remember that but I think if it's uh but if it's missing we definitely want it to be added I thank you for that totally fair even if it is a little mean um and I also want to flag a couple of things that committee members have already brought up so um, in our November meeting, there was a request for checking in and talking about what's happening legislatively. Um, so we're going to do that today. This will be the first time we actually talk about what's happening legislatively as part of this committee work. Um, so that was a direct request that we'll be following up on today. Um, and then second request that is actually the next thing I'm going to talk about um, is whether or not we want to spin off a work group and have a little bit more dedicated conversation around health equity and cost containment. So let's go ahead a couple of slides, two slides, please, John D. Okay, so I wanna just recap a little bit where the health equity and quality and cost conversation has been over the last couple of years. So, our predecessor committee, the Cost Growth Target Implementation Committee, initially recommended strategies for quality and equity in the Cost Growth Target Program, four strategies that were um, in that final report and recommendations, including public reporting on a standard set of quality measures, monitoring for negative impacts of the Cost Growth Target, conducting analysis and activities to improve equity. Um, and we had a lot of discussion earlier about the difference between looking for negative impacts and avoiding negative impacts and then doing things that actively um, improve the situation. Um, and then a placeholder for additional strategies. We think um, the, the implementation committee had thought that there was some work around um, convening providers, addressing low value care complications, um, and also an expectation that other things would come up as the committee and future committee reviewed data and talked about strategies. So that was the initial framework. Um, next. 
in 2022, we did a bunch of work on this. We didn't necessarily bring it all back to the committee. We didn't have a lot of um, public facing discussion on this, but some of the work that we completed in 2022 um, included connecting with the Health Equity Committee and the Health Plan Quality Metrics Committee. So two of our sister committees under the Oregon Health Policy Board. And we worked with those groups to identify a list of standardized quality measures that could be used for monitoring. So we have that as a starting list. Um, in April of last year, we also published a data brief and held a public hearing on the impact of costs to people in Oregon. Um, we stratified that data by race, ethnicity, by income, and a couple of other demographic variables where it was possible. We've had a number of conversations about quality and equity efforts in other cost growth target states and where there might be opportunities to align the work. Um, one of the one of the other states that's really digging into this um, states are Connecticut and Rhode Island. Um, they have affordability standards as part of their work, um, and that's something that we've been really looking at. We have ex uh, explored some potential data sources and opportunities to monitor negative impacts, specifically as it relates to the healthcare workforce. So we've been looking a lot at available data and how we might be able to monitor potential negative impacts of the cost growth target or efforts to meet the cost growth target on the workforce. Not quite ready to come out with a report on that yet or bring any of that data forward, but it's something we've been preparing. And then we've also been doing a lot of work behind the scenes to build analysis and build analytic tools for exploring variation in cost and utilization by populations. So we know different markets, Medicaid, Medicare, commercial, different age groups, um, different parts of the state have different patterns in their cost and utilization. And we wanna make sure that we have the data ready and we'll be able to um, look at that. So just a little bit of what we've been doing behind the scenes. Next. So in our November meeting, when we were talking about the plan for 2023, um, uh, there was a, a couple of comments made about this being a real opportunity for the advisory committee to learn more about what other states are doing and how other states are thinking about equity and cost growth and thinking about if there are opportunities to align or adopt additional strategies, we really just have some focused attention on this and incorporating that work into our recommendations. So we had a proposal to create a work group that was a subset of committee members who would um, meet separately for a couple of months and explore these opportunities, have some more focused conversations, and then bring back ideas on a recommendation to the full committee. Next slide. Um, so just a summary again of all of this. So the purpose of this work group would be to have some deeper discussion and come back with those ideas and recommendations. Um, deliverable would be those recommendations back to the full committee. Probably four to six meetings. They would likely be shorter meetings than our full three hour committee meetings, maybe not, um, between February and September. Because we're meeting every other month, we'd be able to stagger um, these work group meetings. Um, and then tentative proposal, um, thinking three to five advisory committee members. We might also reach out to the Health Equity Committee and see if any of their members would like to participate as a, um, in partnership with us um, and then staff and consultant support. There is also a very high level draft charter in your meeting materials um, that summarizes the same information um, just for context. So let me stop there and see if there are any questions or reactions or if the committee members who brought this idea up in November want to add any more context. Hey, hey, Sarah, this is Hirash, and uh, just, uh, just so the purpose of that committee would be kind of developing some cost containment ideas and, and parity type things that could be brought to this committee uh, for reaction. I don't know if it would be as far as cost containment strategies. I think that could be part of it, but I think it's more of what does it mean to incorporate equity into this cost work in general oh, like, uh, across okay. the board from our reporting, our analysis, strategy development, committee discussion? I think it's more broad than just cost containment strategy. Okay. So e equity is, is and, and cost containment, is that the book here is? I'm just trying to have what is the, the scope here on, the, on that committee? Yeah, Jeremy, can you go back one? I think we have those initial recommendations, um, whether it's about measurement or 
engagement, I, I think the purpose of this group would be to help create some of those parameters and define what that conversation is a little bit more concretely for this work. But um, Michael, I know you have your hand up and I know you have thoughts about this. So help me out here, please. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I was one of the people who suggested uh, we have a work group do this because I kind of feel like, like I feel like I'm pretty, I'm a pretty deep expert around equity work and I'm struggling trying to figure out what this looks like in cost growth containment because I don't think there's been a lot of conversations about that. And so I don't know if we're all on the same page. I think it would just be helpful for us to kind of have some dedicated time to really think around what does equity look like in terms of cost growth, right? And some of the strategies, what our goals are. Again, there's a difference between trying to like be neutral versus trying to actively, you know, improve equity and what is our stance. And I think sometimes that as we make our decisions around cost growth mitigation strategies, we should have a really good understanding of kind of what we're looking for in terms of when we say we want to infuse equity. And so I think it's really just an opportunity for us to come together, folks with lots of different expertise and information and kind of build a or co-create a picture of what it looks like um, in cost growth containment. Because I don't, I haven't heard anyone really state like they know what it looks like yet or how we're gonna measure it or how we're even gonna think about it. And um, I think without that kind of conversation, um, we're not gonna be able to really help move Oregon forward in terms of eliminating health inequities by 2030. So um, I know I, I would love a chance to talk with people uh, in more in depth and really learn about what this can look like. So I don't know if that's helpful, but. Sarah, my, my question was just um, in, in terms of how, how um, what the process is for populating the committee. Yeah, so this would be a work group that would be a subset of the committee. I don't think we need to do anything formal like an application process. I was going to ask for volunteers and get a general sense of interest. Um, Felisa, if you have uh, other recommendations on process, we can do that too. No, I definitely think we we shouldn't uh, we don't want to add process and exclude people. So I think if if this is a, a topic area that you are con one concerned about um, and can do the four to six meetings, I think it would be important to have people who are volunteering. I think if this is also a topic area that your organization internally is doing a lot of work on and trying to drive a discussion around, I think this is a helpful tool that this might be a helpful committee and you would be very helpful in helping move the discussion um and i think the other thing i want to say and just acknowledge is we are not living in a perfect world on this on well we're not living in a perfect world period but on the issue of racial equity and equity in healthcare, um we're not doing a good job here and so we can just acknowledge that um, and know that everybody who is coming to this space, I think, wants to do genuine improvement. So if you're interested in doing genuine improvement, join the committee. So it'd be great if people want to jump in and um, make help make a change here. Yay, Gil. Gil's in the chat saying, hell yeah. <laughs> um, Greg's asking in the chat how long we should expect the meetings to be. I think that is flexible depending on people's availability. I proposed four to six meetings because I think that makes sense for a, a reasonable arc of what we might cover. Um, I would say maybe 90 minute meetings. Uh, mm, I don't know. I think this conversation could be very broad and very deep and we could take a long time or we could keep it a little more tightly focused. Um, I think this could take as much time as people have for it. Um, I see we also have Michael, Stefan and Karis volunteering. It's great. Thank you so much. This is really fantastic, and I think I don't want to discourage people. If you want to, if you're sitting here thinking, you know, you're going through your calendar, you're looking at something, and you're thinking, I don't know. You can always circle back with Sarah, Greg, great, um, and then we'll overlap this this committee with some folks from the Health Equity Committee uh, of the Health Policy Board. So this could be a really good, robust discussion, and I think we're looking forward to um, bringing some. I, items back to do some work on this. So please feel free to jump in or ask questions additionally in the chat. Is there anything else on this, Sarah? Thanks so much for everyone who volunteered. Um, I will follow up with you separately about scheduling and next steps. 
And Sarah, just so you know, I, I mean, I'm not volunteering not just because I don't want to, because I, I think I just want the best people to be out there to be able to contribute to this. Again, my background is more finance and cost and, you know, in reimbursement area. So, but I'm more than happy to, if it's needed in this area, but like to see somebody that had more experts and ideas on how to do that, to come forward. Uh, Ardesh, you are the best people, so you should feel free yeah. to just jump I, in. So I'm, I'm going to be in, but I'd like to get okay. in. What, um, let me propose that we will meet um, in February, we'll pull this group together, meet in February, and we'll be able to report back, um, give everyone an update on either a tighter charter and what we'll actually be doing, um, or next steps um, at the March meeting. Sarah, if I may, as I as I think about that charter work, there are both opportunities and risks from an equity standpoint in the work that we're doing with cost growth. And the opportunities, what Michael called out, which is how do we use this work to really drive equity in our system? I think we also need to take a look at some of the recommendations that come out of the committee for uh, mitigating costs and, and put a, a, a lens on them to make sure that we're not exacerbating equity issues through those processes. And that, that might be a framework to start to think from. Yeah, I think that's really great. Maybe we could add as part of what the work group would do would be that framework or some key questions that every recommended strategy be bounced against. Okay, thank you so much. We will continue this conversation. Lisa, back to you. Great, thank you. Um, I am, we're ready to move on to the next topic uh, in the agenda, uh, which is the legislative session has kicked off in Oregon. I think um, just a little bit of a quick, what is legislative session for folks uh, to be inclusive. So the Oregon legislative session runs for about six months from January to the end of June um, on the odd numbered years and a shorter session usually in February that runs for about a month and the even numbered years. There are 90, legislature, 90 legislators and we have a bicameral legislature. So we have a Senate and a House. Um, and for something to happen in both of those, to get to the governor's desk to become law, it has to go through both of those uh, bodies. So that's just a quick overview of the legislative session. I think most, and I know folks on this call, most folks are familiar with what that means. Um, and, you know, I think it's it's sausage making at its finest. So <laughs> uh, the 2023 legislative session has kicked off. Um, people are sworn in. The other thing I'll note that's unique about this session is that three quarters of the Oregon legislature is new. And so for the first time since term limits, we've had a really big turnover in our legislature. We have a lot of new faces, um, a lot of new faces on our health care committees. Um, so it's very exciting. And it, it continues to be one of the most diverse uh, legislatures in the history of Oregon. So both of those things are unique and exciting. We have an, uh, There's an unprecedented number of bills that I'm sure... Uh, Phil and Ashley are going to go over, um, as I'm sure they're like reading and clicking away in this meeting. To, <laughs> um, and you know, I think that we have to remember that the health authority um, and this committee and all of the committees that sent over the health authority uh, serve at the pleasure of the governor, and so do many of the staff. And so the agenda that the health authority engages in and how they engage as a state agency may be different from us personally, or as we think about uh, sort of our, our separate interests. I wanna encourage us as we, as we go through the agenda for the committee that each of us may have an agenda and a role in our own organizations that will move through the legislature. Um, but as a committee, we also have an agenda and a set of goals that we uh, committed to um, around the cost growth target. And so I think how we engage and how we support the work of Phil and Ashley and the governor, I think is really important. And so I encourage people as they reach out to, as, if there is outreach needed to you um, to engage in this legislative session that we're responsive to them and think of, of our roles here as members of this advisory committee. So. 
I'm going to turn it over, uh, unless Sarah has anything to add, I'm going to turn it over to Phil and Ashley. All right, Phil and Ashley, you're up. Thank you so much, Felisa, for that wonderful um, overview. Uh, hi, everyone. Again, just in case uh, you joined a little bit late, I'm Ashley Thurstrup. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the Interim Government Relations Director here at OHA. And Phil, do you want to um, introduce yourself again and provide your role, and then we'll jump in? Sure thing, yeah. Uh, Philip Schmidt, uh, he, him pronouns, and I work uh, for Ashley on the Government Relations team, and one of my specific areas of focus includes the cost growth work. Um, so uh, thank you again for having us. Yeah, great. So today, um, what we're planning on doing is just providing an, a high level overview of um, bills that either directly impact cost growth target or may impact the cost growth target program. Um, we'll provide you know, information about the content and, um, and just a little bit about where they're at now um, in response to a request from committee members in November. You wanna go to the next slide, please. So we'll provide an overview of um, the 2023 legislative session and the bills that we've seen to date related to healthcare um, cost growth for the advisory committee's information. And again, um, you know, this is just an overview of bills and their content. We're not going to be providing analysis today, but we do want you to have information so that you can track and be aware of these bills. All right, next slide, please. So I think Valisa covered this as well, but this presentation is for information only. OHA does not have a position on any of these bills, and we're not asking the committee to take a position on any of these bills either. Some key dates for all of you. Um, yesterday, session kicked off. Uh, it was an exciting day to be in Salem. Um, and then in, in order for a bill to be heard in a committee by first chamber deadline, which is April 4th, it has to be posted on an agenda for a work session by March 17th. Um, and however, this doesn't apply to rules, revenue or joint committees. And then the same applies for the second chamber. Um, a bill has to be heard in committee by the deadline of May 19th in the second chamber. And it has to be posted for a work session by May 5th. And then June 15th is target signee die, and June 25th is the constitutional signee die. So those are the important legislative sessions to note. Dates. All right, so next slide, please. So getting into the healthcare cost growth target program um, bills, if you can go to the next slide. There's three specific bills um, that are directly about the healthcare cost, cost growth target program. Um, this first bill, House Bill 2091, delays penalties under the program until 2026, and this would include performance improvement plans, and then it delays imposing financial penalties for exceeding the cost growth target from 2026 to 2029. Um, the sponsors are Representative um, Javadi and Representative Reynolds. Um, it's currently in the House Behavioral Health and Healthcare Committee. It hasn't been scheduled. Great, next slide, please. House Bill 2742 would exclude certain costs from consideration of healthcare expenditures for the purpose of the program. So it, ex it would exempt any costs incurred by a healthcare entity to meet a community's need for access to healthcare. And that could include, um, but not be limited to workforce costs, pharmaceutical costs, costs of essential services, which would be defined as services on the prioritized list, a service directly related to treating a chronic condition, pregnancy related services, prevention services, health system navigation services and care coordination. And then another part of this bill would require state agencies and um, legislative fiscal officers to prepare fiscal impact statements for all bills expected to affect the ability of the state or healthcare entities to meet healthcare uh, cost growth targets. And again, this, this bill is also in the House Behavioral Health and Healthcare Committee. All right, and then the third cost growth target bill um, is House Bill 2085. This would change the name of the healthcare cost, cost growth target program to premium cost growth target program and would restrict the scope of the program to reducing growth in premium costs. 
Um, it would also remove provider organizations from the cost growth target program. And it would change the program from measuring total healthcare expenditures to measuring premium cost growth. Um, it would also measure and hold accountable payers for premium cost growth. And this is currently in the House Behavioral Health and Healthcare Committee as well. So all three of those bills that I just mentioned were all sponsored by Javadi and Reynolds. All right, so next we're gonna get into um, bills that have the potential to impact healthcare cost growth. And again, I want to just make the disclaimer that this isn't an exhaustive list. Um, bills dropped, they're continuing to drop, but they, they dropped about four or five days ago. Um, so we pulled the ones that we think are the most applicable to all of you, but just recognizing that there may be more that, are, that will be introduced. So if you could move to the next. Thank you. So these four bills um, are all coverage mandates. And as usual, we're seeing a lot of these coverage mandates and um, there may be more coming. So the first is House Bill 2538. This is sponsored by Rep Reynolds and Rep Nelson. And it requires that health insurance coverage of healthcare interpretation services that are legally mandated. Um, House Bill 2545 is sponsored by Rep Nos, and it requires health insurance uh, reimbursement of cost of behavioral health care services provided by master's degree level students under clinical supervision. Senate Bill 491 is sponsored by Senator Patterson, uh, Representative Graber, Senator Hansel, and Senator Manning. And this requires that health insurance coverage um, of specified fertility services and treatments. And it also directs Oregon Health Authority and the Department of Consumer and Business Services to study access to fertility and reproductive endocrinology services and then report those findings to legislature in September of 2024. And then the last bill here, the last insurance um, coverage related bill is Senate Bill 628 sponsored by Senator Lieber. And it requires health benefit plan and healthcare service contract coverage of pediatric autoimmune neuropsychiatric um, disorders. All right. Next, please. All right. So these uh, seven bills listed here, I'm not going to go through each one in detail for the interest of time, but the focus of these bills are on regulating pharmacy benefit managers. Um, they are all, except for the Senate bill, of course, um, in the House Behavioral Health and Healthcare Committee meetings or committee right now. And at the meeting last night, Rep. Nose announced that these bills will likely have hearings in the next few weeks. So just wanted you to alert you to all of that. Um, and then there are a few study bills that aren't on this list that could be placeholders as well. That's Senate Bill 192 um, and House Bill 3012. And Senate Bill 192, it would require OHA to study ways to lower the cost of prescription drugs. And House Bill 3012 would require pharmacy benefit measures to report data um, to Department of Consumer and, and Business Services. They may be placeholders. Great. So next um, three slides. And these are the last bills that we're going to highlight today. Uh, so House Bill 2537 and its companion bill, Senate Bill 486, um, so the sponsors of 2537 are Rep Nose, Rep Dexter, and Senator Patterson, and then Senate Bill 486, we have Senator Patterson, um, Senator Lieber, and Rep Goodwin sponsoring. So this bill would require OHA um, or CCO to make per diem Medicaid payments to hospitals for patients enrolled in uh, medical assistance programs when the patient no longer needs hospital care, but the patient's discharge is delayed due to circumstances beyond the control of the hospital. Um, House Bill 2878 establishes um, Aligning for Health pilot program, the Aligning for Health pilot program. This would be administered by OHA to test alternative methods for payment for healthcare within a pilot region of the state um, through phased implementation. And this is sponsored by Rep Dexter, Senator Anderson and Rep Reynolds. And then the last bill here is um, House Bill 2432. And that would require uh, DCBS to study trends in reimbursement paid to healthcare providers by insurers and third-party administrators. 
All right, and then next slide, please. So I think uh, many of you probably already do this, but um, in case you, you, you don't, this is a great way to follow along. Um, Oregon Legislative Information System, we included the link here. You can sign up to follow bills. Um, so you'll get an email notification when they're up for hearings um, and work sessions, and there's um, ability to stream live committee hearings, and you can also go back and watch recorded hearings as well. All right, and I think that is it. That's what we have for you today. Hey, Ashley, could I just yeah, add one no. more thing? Um, in the, you know, the list of bills, it, we, we didn't sort of capture this, uh, but I, I think it's worth mentioning to this committee that, you know, it, it's pretty clear that workforce and workforce shortages will be a significant conversation throughout this legislative session. And, you know, uh, there will be folks that are uh, pointing to workforce as, you know, cost drivers, et cetera. And I just, you know, some of the track uh, for, for this committee. Perfect. Great, do you folks have questions? Oh, we have a question from Gil in the chat about sharing the slides. Absolutely. Pink Sarah. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, I'm sure um, that both Ashley and Phil appreciate everybody not asking them to have a crystal ball of what's going to happen during the legislative session. I assume that those questions will come in March. Um, <laughs> if you do have <laughs> questions, uh, as time goes on, please reach out uh, to Sarah and um, she can direct those to Phil or Ashley. Um, and again, the legislative website is a, a treasure trove of information. And you can actually, um, on this slide, you can see you can watch hearings, et cetera. There's a little icon um, once a hearing gets started. This is a video. So you can go back and watch things and you can watch archives of things. Uh, if we don't have anything else on this topic, we're going to jump in to a bigger topic. So, Peter? You bet. Um, you know, last meeting, we we started our discussion about adjustments to the cost, cost growth target. And uh, obviously, we need to continue that work. You know, we just heard about legislative activity around our committee work and around cost growth target. Um, we, we anticipate that will continue as we go through uh, the inflationary period uh, that we're experiencing. There's been a lot of discussion as well that, well, general inflation may very well lapse uh, with a potential recession in 23. The way that healthcare is structured has an impact that goes on through 23 and 24 based just on uh, annualized contracts and longer term contracts. And we'll see some of that inflation that occurred in 2022 actually impacting later years. So um, uh, let's continue that discussion. Let's uh, spend a little time recapping where we landed in November. And then uh, Sarah will help walk us through some recommendations as well. Sarah, up to you. Yep. Thanks, Peter. And just before I jump into the to the overview, I think I want to knit these two agenda items together a little bit. So we're going to talk about potentially adjusting the cost growth target today. We're going to talk about what the current timeline is. And I also want to recognize that those three bills that directly affect the cost growth target program that Ashley just reviewed, and if any of those move, pass, are changed, that could change our timeline um, and that could change our decision making here. So again, we don't have that crystal ball. We don't know exactly how this will all play out, but I just want to recognize that as we're talking about the timeline, we have the timeline as it's currently written and we have proposed timelines that might be modified um, throughout legislative session. Okay, um, next slide, please, Jeroni. All right, so just a little bit of a recap of the November conversation because that was a long time ago. So in November, we talked about the timeline for when accountability measures phase in 
and I'll show a recap of that in a second as well. We talked about the list of factors that may cause an entity to reasonably exceed the cost growth target and the addition of macroeconomic factors explicitly on that list. Um, again, workforce, inflation, all of those things we've been talking about. We talked about the relationship between inflation and healthcare spending, um, how one is connected to the other, as well as the lag pe pe period that Peter just mentioned. We shared some data on current and historic inflation and wage growth, as well as what some of the projections are for the next couple of years, um, although that is changing rapidly. Um, we also reviewed how the implementation committee initially set Oregon's target and what the factors were or the, you know, the lack of a formula that was there as part of that initial setting, um, as well as an update on how other states are revisiting their cost growth target and how other states are handling this conversation around inflation. Um, we've linked to the November slides if anyone wants the refresher of all of that information, but we, we did cover a lot in November. Next. So um, again, just recapping a couple of the key takeaways from the November conversation. Inflation impacts healthcare spending growth, check. Um, the impact is not immediate, but delayed or lagged. General inflation in the US is dramatically higher than it's been in the last 20 years. And healthcare prices have grown at a slightly elevated rate and we can continue um, to expect elevated growth into 2023. Um, and general inflation is forecast to significantly drop in 2023. So things are still changing and, and moving around. Next. This is our timeline slide. So a reminder of our current, um, how accountability works and when accountability kicks in. So we are in year one. Um, we are planning on reporting and as I said earlier, publicly reporting payer and provider level performance relative to the cost growth target this spring. That's that first phase, that transparency layer. Um, in year two, that would be the, the first time that performance improvement plans could apply to a payer or provider organization that exceeded the cost growth target without a good reason. Um, and then year five, um, which is 2026, um, would be the first time a financial penalty could potentially be applied. So this is the current timeline with the phase in. Um, the implementation committee, as a reminder, had wanted a very deliberate phase in of these accountability mechanisms with a pretty long ramp up in recognition of um, contracting periods and the time it takes to set up initiatives or um, anything that might actually affect cost growth in the future. Next. And then finally, just a recap of the potential factors that may cause a payer or provider organization to reasonably exceed the cost growth target. This list was initially set by the implementation committee. We've done some additional um, building out of what's in each of these categories, and then we've added macroeconomic factors to the list. And if you might remember the November conversation, there's some nuance in here. So if, as we're talking about macroeconomic factors, for example, workforce costs, um, labor costs, there's a, there's a range. We could be talking about labor costs that is a minimum wage increase. We could be talking about the, co the costs for contracted travel nurses um, as a result of the pandemic. We could be talking about executive compensation. So in each of these factors, in each of these categories, we wanna tease them out a little bit and not just assume that there's sort of a one answer. Um, there's a lot of nuance under these things and we wanna bring as much of that nuance and disaggregation to some of these conversations as we can. Okay, any questions about everything that we talked about in November before I keep going? I'm not seeing, oh, Teresa, yeah. Hi, um, well, I'm trying to remember the November conversation and I'm and, and wondering if one thing that we discussed at all was, um, Another potential driver for a, a reason to exceed the cost growth target is um, I, in the Medicaid space in particular, which is what I'm most uh, familiar with, is, is for instance, the, the state um, getting uh, implementing redeterminations after a long period of time of not doing that. So then the risk of the population um, really increases dramatically in in a situation like that. So I know that only affects potentially, you know, 
uh, Medicaid, um, but just wondering if we consider things like that or if that's worth noting in, in, in a summary like this. Yeah, thanks, Teresa. I don't think we have explicitly called out redeterminations and the changing risk of the population, but I think that for me pretty cleanly fits in changes in federal or state law. Mm -hmm. that, that is both a change in federal and state law and will have impacts that is out of the control of a healthcare entity. So I, I think that's a great addition to the list. Yeah, I think, I think that's a really important piece, Teresa. And along with that, maybe some of the uh, Medicaid changes in reimbursement would also fall under uh, changes in federal or state law uh, as they apply to behavioral health. Great, thank you. I'm sorry, okay. I, I interrupted someone. Okay, let me go through a few more um, points from November before we tee up our discussion. So next slide, please. Um, okay, so Michael Baylett um, presented on the alternatives that other states are considering. So those five alternatives are summarized here. Um, in the left column. So the first alternative, number one, make no adjustments. Don't do anything, just say, well, we're gonna ride this out, wait and see what happens. And um, we have a target, we'll keep, we'll keep the target. The second alternative is to make no adjustments, keep the target as it is, but acknowledge the impact of inflation, labor shortages, economic conditions when interpreting results. So that would be a commitment to providing all of that context as part of the public reporting and conversation. I want to note that if we do nothing today, this is our current plan. This is the path we are on um, if we don't make any changes in this conversation. Um, alternative three is to create a specific allowance for exceeding the target on a time limited basis for those years with very high inflation. This is the approach that Rhode Island has adopted. They have modified their cost growth target for 23, 24, and 25 specifically. Um, one thing to note about Rhode Island is that Rhode Island actually didn't have a target for 23, 4, and 5. Their target had expired, and so they had to set a new target. So Rhode Island was not in the position where we're in, where we have set a target for 10 years and we're talking about changing it. They didn't have a target and they had to set one. So they, cho they chose to set it a little bit higher because of inflation for that short period of time. Um, the fourth alternative is to redefine the target values on a time limited basis. Um, and this is what Massachusetts has done. Massachusetts has a target in statute and their committee, their version of the governance committee has the ability to set the target every year. Um, if they don't, it sort of defaults to the statutory value. Um, and so Massachusetts increased their target for 2023. They have this conversation every year, so it is possible they will revisit, increase, or keep a higher target in future years, but they do one year at a time. Um, also want to note something that we talked about in November. There, it's kind of a, a false distinction almost, like the difference between creating an allowance and redefining the target. So at the end of the day, is the number changing or not? Um, you know, we can say we're not changing the target, but we're going to create an allowance or a buffer that sits on top of it. That practically also changes the target. So these are presented as two different alternatives and they, they sort of structurally are different. But at the end of the day, we would be saying this is acceptable cost growth in the state at this level. Um, and then the fifth alternative is to just waive the target entirely. And this is something that um, had come up late last year was maybe that you, you might've heard the talking point, you know, maybe the cost growth target was a good idea in 2019, but given the current environment, it's just not a good idea anymore. We should just take it off the table entirely. So these are the five alternatives. Um, again, as I said, Oregon is currently on path two. And if we do not do anything else today, um, we will not change the target, but we would, of course, acknowledge all of these factors and try to quantify impacts as much as possible um, in public reporting moving forward. Next slide. Okay, and then finally, um, Michael Bailey also teed up these questions for you for your consideration in November. So first question is how should Oregon balance protecting consumers who are also facing rising inflation and a potential recession with being fair to provider organizations and insurers that are experiencing these greatly increased costs. So at the end of the day, cost growth target program is about um, the impact of costs on people. And so how do we maintain this balance in our decision-making? 
Second question is what precedent will be set if Oregon chooses to modify the cost growth target value? One of the principles that the implementation committee, um, your predecessor committee had uh, held to was that it's really important to know what the target is in advance. It's really important to have that predictability and stability, especially given contracting um, and the, the timelines that things happen on. Having the target set and knowing what it is, is really important. And so if we're modifying the cost growth target values, what does that do to that framework and what precedent does it set? And then finally, on what basis should any modifications be made and for what duration? Is this a one year, two year, six month? Do we revisit? When do we revisit? Um, how often do we revisit? Again, because Oregon has set a target for 10 years um, with a checkpoint in 2025 about revisiting, um, does it make sense to mix it up? We're not structured like some of the other states that revisit and reset their cost growth target value every single year. So um, on what basis? And then I think Andrew put you on the spot. I think you actually raised a point in our last meeting um, that was really great here. And it was, would we consider modifying the target if the reverse economic situation was true? If this was an unprecedented time of um, profits, would we ever lower the cost growth target? Um, would we ever go in the, the, the reverse direction? So I wanted to make sure that's part of the, the committee's deliberations today. Next. So a couple of key points that I wanted to bring up from the November discussion, and this is all in more detail in the meeting summary as well. Um, I think things that I heard from you in November, it's really important to provide more clarity and direction for payers and provider organizations. Payers and provider organizations need some of that stability and certainty. They need to know where this is going and what this program looks like. There was some hesitancy to change the target value, um, but committee members expressed a slight preference for a short-term adjustment or allowance that's public so that we would officially change the target or officially create that allowance rather than just leaving everything up to the determination of reasonableness discussion. There was some discomfort with letting this be sort of up to the state and sort of letting it play out as part of those negotiations. And then finally, um, as I alluded to, maybe the committee wasn't super clear on the difference between a built-in adjustment that would change the target value and a built-in pre-recognition of macroeconomic factors that would not change the target value. So we all agree economic factors are having an impact here. This is, this is the context that this program is operating in, but how do we draw those lines and is it an official change or is it more just a recognition of the context? Okay, that's all the recap. So I want to give you a staff recommendation today to spark the discussion, just something to react to, um, something for your consideration. I think it's always easier to have a straw proposal um, to react to than just leaving an open discussion about what we should do. So last slide here um, is the staff recommendation. So we propose that we keep the cost growth target value as it is currently set. It is set at 3.4% for the next couple of years. Um, we already have a checkpoint in 2025 about whether or not the cost growth target value should change from 3.4%. So this would just keep the original timeline as is. We would keep macroeconomic factors on that list of good reasons, and we would keep building out um, the details underneath that of what that looks like and how we look at that. Um, and then what would be new um, is that OHA, we, we would commit to not putting any payer or provider organization on a performance improvement plan for cost growth between 2021 and 2022. Um, we heard that this, there's a request for certainty, and I think while we have been sort of assuming and operating under the assumption that, well, yeah, it's probably really unlikely that in this time period there's any cost growth that we could reasonably tease out and say should result in a performance improvement plan, um, this would actually create the certainty. We would officially delay accountability on that timeline one year. Uh, then what we would do, we would propose coming back when we have the cost growth data for 2021 and 2022. Um, there's, a, there's a typo on the slide, I apologize. Um, we would have the 2020 to 2021 data in May. We'd have the 21-22 data later in the year, early next year. We can then look at what's happening statewide. I think one of the conversations that we're having is to what extent is the, are these macroeconomic factors affecting everyone? Is it all payers and all providers that are experiencing this somewhat equally? Or is it really just one part of the health system or just one part of the state? Um, and I think we wanna see to what extent that's playing out across the board before we make any changes or 
we would recommend before you make any changes. Um, if the overall state average, if growth everywhere has sort of shifted, then that makes more sense. We have sort of a new, a new baseline. Um, and we could look at outliers relative to that new state average rather than outliers compared to 3.4%. I'm not entirely convinced, this is me speculating on the record. Like, I, I don't know that that's gonna be true. I don't know that we're going to see the same effects and the same increases equally distributed across the health system in the state. Um, like hospitals are having a really different experience than primary care providers. Outpatient looks really different than inpatient. Specialty looks really different. Payers and providers are having a really different experience in this time. So I think I wanna be careful about just making a blanket assumption that inflation looks the same for everybody. Once we have that data and can understand better how the effects are distributed, we could discuss further adjustments. We're not taking changing the cost growth target value off the table for any future years. Um, but we would wait until we had data, um, and that could be a little bit more of a data-informed decision rather than um, feels a little bit more speculative right now. So that's my recommendation to start the conversation. Peter, back to you. Let me open it up and see if people have some comments. Mary Beth? Um, yeah, so just to, I think, for clarity's sake, I wanted to... Um, see Sarah for the so this recommendation if you were to go back to the timeline where it says like we are here it would essentially just move the yes to a no for the third column under the pips right yeah Gerardi can you go back to that calendar slide that is what it would do um okay keep going back um one more one more okay here yes so in Year two, the third column where it says, mm -hmm. do PIPs apply? Yes, that would become no. PIPs would not kick in until year three. Okay. Um, just a general comment. I think that this is essentially, I think you said this, but wanted to rephrase my own words, uh, extending like the data collection portion uh, or phase of this um, group and, and the work of the, the cost growth target itself to determine kind of the state of healthcare costs because of inflation and because of the the scenario that we're in right now and the circumstances that Oregon is experiencing. Um, so I'm not opposed to this. I think that given the discussion from November, I think this is probably a good alternative, um, but I'm curious to hear what other people have to say as well. Here, Desh, would you uh, let us know your thoughts? Yeah, uh, you, you know, the, personally, I, I think this is the right approach. And again, my thing is that a couple of things, right? One is that we are in unprecedented times with high inflation. And secondly, I think uh, target setting, you know, generally, as we know, uh, we can't really do the administrative work of recalibrating targets because there's going to be situations that come up all the time. And if we recalibrate targets all the time, we'll be probably recalibrating it for many reasons that's, you know, that's not they haven't predicted yet or haven't really come on yet. So I think it, I think the recommendations look sound to me. I just want to let you know that I can support this. Thank you. Andrew, your thoughts. Thank you. Uh, yeah, in, in line with the others who have spoken so far, I think the, the option uh, makes a lot of sense. I mean, the, 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 main, the main considerations for me and I'd encourage us to have all of our decisions be data driven. And, you know, we don't quite know exactly, you know, what we're gonna see yet. So, uh, you know, I think it's a good idea to let that data come in and, and see how the macroeconomic and other factors are influencing the target. Uh, keep in, keeping in mind, we can revisit this issue every year. And, you know, we if whatever, we agree and whatever changes we make or don't make uh, this year, we can make different changes or, or not make different changes uh, next year. Uh, and, and finally, just say, you know, generally caution, as, as someone else in, you know, noted, against making major shifts every year and kind of, you know, going up and down. You know, we don't want to wave the target, change the target every single year based on uh, things that are going on. Thanks. You know, Andrew, to, to that point, um, as you think about not changing the rules every year, and yet we know that there have been this lag or delayed impact into 23, especially as it relates 
to contract rates that were otherwise annualized for 22 prior to the inflation hit. Would you adjust the delay of the PIP from 21 through 23 so that you don't have to come back and, and expect to do it again next year? I, I do worry a little bit about tweaking the rules every year as we go forward. So your thoughts on that? Yeah, the, I, I agree. You know, delay and accountability makes sense as we see how this plays out. So I, I don't have any objection to that whatsoever. Julie, I saw your hand come up and then go down. Did you have a comment you'd like to make? I, uh, I was just trying to understand some of the data and then we flip back to that other slide. So I figured it out. So thank you. And just I'm in line with everybody's thoughts here that consistency is good in this case, since you're on a, a five, 10 year run rate here, um, not to be changing this significantly due to just, there's always going to be something, right? Whether it's a inflation or pandemic, or there's always going to be something running in every year. So I think it's good to keep that consistent. Thank you. Uh, Felisa? Yeah, I uh, I appreciate what other folks are um, saying, and I agree. I also just want to caution us, though. I think when we think about performance improvement plans and accountability, I, I want us to make sure that we realize that I, I think that these could be actually helpful for systems. So I am cautious to delay that because I I think that when we think about how you, well, let me just use an example. When we in our organization put another organization on a performance improvement plan, that is not necessarily meant as a, a sort of a punishment. It's meant as a, a learning opportunity on how you can make changes and develop as an organization. And that I think is how we should think about performance improvement plans. That's how I think about them for my staff. That's how we think about them organization to organization in our union. And I really want us to think about that when we think about systems. So delaying away, delaying opportunities for growth, I don't necessarily think is, is a good idea. So. I I appreciate the move to like the 2021, 2022, but beyond that, I think we have a lot of lessons that we have learned out of this time period. <laughs> um, and a lot of healthcare lessons that we have learned out of this time period. And not all of them have actually been bad lessons. I think that there's a lot of really good takeaways. So I want to make sure that how we're incorporating those, how people are developing still stands. Andrew, a follow-up from you. Yeah, thank you. And uh, Felisa made a great point there. And, you know, I, I was thinking, at least personally here, that the delay in the, the PIP would be if missing the target <clears throat> was based solely or primarily on these mac macroeconomic factors. I, you know, if, <laughs> if, we're, if we're able to distinguish that and, and prove that, or if they, you know, if it was if it was clearly based on things other than that, that maybe that wouldn't be. And I don't know if that's, I don't know if that's even possible once we see uh, the data, but uh, I just wanna say, I, I think Felisa made a good point there. Andrew, I just wanna clarify that because macroeconomic factors are on the list of good reasons, if an entity is exceeding the target sort of demonstrably be only because of inflation, um, or workforce are one of those factors, that we wouldn't be moving forward to an accountability conversation or performance improvement plan at all. But I, I do, I think in this recommendation, we are saying that we would just postpone accountability full stop, just move the whole timeline out a year. That probably would also influence our timeline for rulemaking. Um, we would just push that out a year and give folks certainty that um, we were not going to begin that process regardless of you know, whether it was inflation related or other reason related. Thank you, Greg. Yeah, um, I just have a question, I think from the slides from last meeting um, when we were talking about the relationship between inflation writ large and healthcare inflation, we noted, we noted that there was a two year lag statistically between the two. And so I was, I'm a little bit unclear then about uh, the third bullet 
um, applying to 2021 to 2022, then given that the, I believe the bulk of the inflation, significant inflation uh, spike occurred during 2021 and 2022. So we wouldn't, you know, from, from the data that we have, expect the uh, that to be a, a macro and ac economic factor with regard to cost um, increases we observed if during that period, we would expect it to, to play a role further on. Um, just wondering if, if there's anything that could be said about that. Yeah, you know, Greg, the way I think about it is, um, <clears throat> as was, uh, I think Sarah mentioned it, there are um, really significant differences based on where you're at in the industry. So in 2022, certainly hospital systems experienced very uh, significant costs uh, for uh, travel workers. And, and that'll show up in that 21 to 22 comparison. The way that hospitals pass those costs on to the industry and ultimately uh, the purchaser of health insurance may have that lag. So I'm not sure the lag works quite that cleanly. It, it's kind of spread throughout the system in different ways. And I'm not quite sure how we get at that. So I think it's a good point to, uh, to acknowledge the delay and the impact on various levels of the industry. Other thoughts, comments? Sarah, one of the things that I'd really like to do as part of this recommendation is be a little bit more specific about what uh, uh, the list of good reasons means. Um, you explained it here as if these macroeconomic effects were the cause of exceeding the target, then um, there would be uh, no action on a PIP, et cetera. And I, I think it's just really important to, to be pretty specific about what that recommendation means. Yeah, um, I'm gonna add a link to the chat in a minute. We had a document from November where we start defining those um, good reasons more specifically. So I wanna provide that as reference. Um, and again, I think that good reason process has been baked into the cost growth target program from the beginning. We would be having that conversation about the reasons for growth and whether or not they were reasonable or not, no matter what, even if we were not in this current economic situation, if there was not a pandemic, we would still be having that conversation because we have recognized that not all cost growth is bad. For example, if an entity's cost growth is because they're really increasing investments in behavioral health and primary care, fantastic, good to go, end of conversation, no accountability. So that is part of it. And I I, I feel like I already said this, but I wanna to try to say it again. Um, I think that, that process, there, we're not proposing any changes to that process. That process already exists. It's already part of the program. All we're saying is that we would still collect the data, report the data, have those conversations with payers and provider organizations about the reasons for their cost growth. We would just not move forward with putting anyone on a performance improvement plan um, until one more year down the road, or potentially, as I'm hearing, given the lag, maybe two years down the road might be a counter proposal. But either way, that process and the, the talking about the reasons um, and whether or not those are good reasons or not um, remains the same. We're not, I'm not recommending any changes to that. That's great. And I think, you know, since we are talking about public accountability here and the public's perception of how the health system writ large is trying to address these issues, we might want to think about um, uh, not just having one line item that said, you know, everybody went up by 12 percent and 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 then somewhere in the on the back page, um, some of the macroeconomic effects and the reason for for uh, uh, different accountability to that. So uh, I, I am cognizant about how do we keep the the public informed of this work, but also how do we uh, help them? Uh, continue to have trust that um, that the state's helping uh, the the system improve. Um, Mary Beth, you were next, and then Bill. Um, yeah, I just had a maybe this is a terrible idea, but uh, <laughs> feel free to let me know that. But um, given what Felisa said and and Sarah's uh, note that you know those conversations are still happening with providers, 
I wonder if it would be a good opportunity to use it as like a practice run so that organizations who want to know how the PIP would work would be able to kind of opt into a practice PIP or a voluntary option um, to like say, this is how the conversation would continue from that point on if you were to be put on a, a PIP or um, these are the sorts of things that would go into a PIP this year based on your performance to the cost growth target. Um, that way, you know, I think like Felisa said, it could be useful, a useful tool, and there's that opportunity to, to potentially learn from that, um, even if we're not, you know, holding them to that. Sorry about that. Still working on the mute button. Thank you, Mary Beth. You know, it's it's interesting. You know, what's the dialogue between um, the provider slash payer and the state relative um, to to this recommendation? And and is there a dialogue piece there? And that's an interesting uh, question, Bill. Thanks, Peter, and thanks to all of you for letting me join today as an observer from the. Uh... Oregon Health Policy Board. Uh, it's a great discussion, uh, and I think all this makes sense. Uh, I think it is uh, good to rely on data to guide the OHA's recommendations and the group's advisory guidance on the target and the accountability, accountability measures. So it will be very helpful to take a look at the actual data uh, on the input costs from providers and health plans later this year. Um, at the same time, uh, we should remind ourselves that about that, the need to balance um, that with the interests of patients and consumers who are also um, having to uh, bear the burdens of the um, of, inf of general inflation. Um, and I think it would be helpful if we could find a way to um, gather good information about that so that the any decisions or, or recommendations or advice that comes from this group be based on data, not only on provider and health plan costs, but also on consumers' financial burdens. Thanks, Bill. Here, Desh. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I think I like the idea of not delaying, you know, the performance improvement plan, but though we may not, you know, the performance improvement plan itself has a negative turn to it, right? That you're not performing well. And so you're on kind of some kind of an improvement, but maybe we could clarify that. Uh, I, I think what I'm after is, is, is uh, the data that kind of that providers and, and uh, you know, health plans could provide to, to uh, for us to understand what is the drivers and the and the in, you know the improvements that they have in place to improve their cost trends? Uh, so I, I think that data would be important. But again, you know, performance improvement plan put in place with no penalties. Really, you know, it, it's what the integrity of that improvement plan really is dependent on the penalties that's going to come with it if you don't perform. So, but I think for data gathering purposes, it might be pretty good to get some information on how organizations are planning to improve their performance to a target and us to get some intelligence around what's happening in the industry. Me, as, as, as you think about, Sarah, go ahead, please. I just want to add, um, tie a couple pieces together here for Herdash's comments. I think one, um, the proposed public hearing that we're thinking about for May would be a really great opportunity to have those conversations with payers and provider organizations. I think that's always been part of the intent. So we do have that sort of already penciled in for May. Um, and then second, my team, um, OHA, we have been meeting with um, all of the payers and we are currently meeting with all of the provider organizations. Um, so we are having those individual conversations right now about cost growth and what the drivers are um, validating the data, getting ready for that public report. So I think there's a lot of opportunity to surface some of the, the findings from those conversations um, to create that space to invite payers and provider organizations to, to share and reflect um, their perspectives. Um, so, so that's a lot of that is happening. It's not that we, I don't want to say we don't have the data and we have to go on this massive data collection effort. We do have the data, we have the processes, the program is validating and reviewing that. And now it's let's how to how to how do we bring that data to you and have that conversation? So Sarah, to, to just recount what you said, 
you would be reporting out on an industry-wide basis about re what's really driving costs and where those costs were coming from. You would also, as OHA, continue to reach out to individual providers and have that discussion about their specific uh, drivers of cost, either on a provider or payer side. Um, but then we wouldn't have the uh, public reporting of PIPs for whatever the, the deferred time period is. Correct. We will be beginning public reporting of payer and provider organization performance relative to the cost growth target for calendar year 2020 to 2021 mm -hmm. in the spring. That is okay. that is the plan. Um, public reporting will happen. We would not penalize anybody for what their cost growth is for that period and for the 21-22 period. Um, I do like Mary Beth's idea of the voluntary PIP. I would be shocked if we had any takers, but I do think that from a staff perspective, um, that would let us test some of the structures. We've been talking about what PIP documentation, what guidance is helpful, how that gets written up, um, negotiating that, all of that. I think it would be great to start working on that. So I'm very open to, to exploring that. I'm, I'm maybe a little skeptical that anyone would want to volunteer themselves for that position though. You know, it's a really interesting concept, and and maybe if you thought a, a little bit about the name of it, uh, of what what do you call it uh, that that really helps organizations prepare their own teams for for the PIP process once it kicked back off. Uh, I don't know that a lot of organizations are going to volunteer for a performance improvement plan. Uh, to your point. Uh, but they may very well um, take advantage of working with the state to build some of the uh, techniques in, in um, reporting and measuring these items uh, with your teams, and, and that might have a lot of value. One thing I would maybe throw out for the committee's consideration is I think we could we could certainly make that available and have those structures. I think maybe something for your consideration is whether or not that would be public would, if an organization opted in and said, yes, we want to test out this voluntary PIP process and have these conversations, would you tell anybody? Or is that something we could work on, you know, behind the scenes with you and get our team lined up? And so I think one of our charges as a program is transparency. And so we have public reporting and then we have these, you know, moving into accountability and when that happens and also how public that is. So I, I throw that out for you. And then I, I do want to say, I think the name change, like we can call it whatever we want at the end of the day, performance improvement plan is in statute. Like that is what it's called in statute. So is this really just, you know, a branding exercise or is this a meaningful, um, a meaningful change in a way that would help payers and provider organizations engage? I think that's the question. Felisa? Yeah, thanks. I um, I uh, uh, appreciate that it's in <laughs> statute. I also think the other thing is I I think that the um, I'm not opposed to the PIP, the performance improvement plan if someone opts in not being public. I think that OEJ works with a lot of institutions and helps them make improvements in all kinds of areas that are not public for, for trade secret reasons and a whole variety of things. However, I do want to make sure that any learnings that an institution or um, a, a payer or provider goes through that can be potentially applied to other payer or providers who maybe are on the edge of not meeting the cost scope target can be shared. So I think that there are some things that you would need to work out with the attorney general's mm -hmm. office and some other folks to figure out how to thread that needle. Um, and then the other thing is I do want to remind us on the opt-in. I agree we should have, we should have an we should have some institutions opt-in, and that would be great. I'd also like to remind that we do have publicly held institutions. So it might be a good exercise for those. Thanks, Felisa. Mary Beth, let's go to you and then Sarah. I, uh, we need to do a time check and uh, determine if there's anything specific you need from this group. I just wanted to uh, agree with what Felisa said, and also just um, as a reminder, uh, the the publicly identifying payers and providers that met or didn't meet the cost growth target are still B 
being publicly identified. It's just whether or not they opt into the PIP that um, would not be. Yes, correct. Great, thanks. Um, thanks for the time check, Peter. I, I think we do want a committee decision here. Um, so I think if you wanna have this as more of a consensus based or if you wanna call a vote or a pulse check vote, however you'd like to handle that like, options. I think in summary, what I've heard, I've heard that the committee is okay with keeping the target as it's currently set, keeping macroeconomic factors on the list of good reasons and continuing to build out the details under that. Um, I've heard, it sounds like you're okay with the recommendation to delay accountability for one year, but to add an opt-in, possibly private voluntary process, um, that would be on the original timeline. I, I, I don't know if I heard a different proposal um, or anything in addition. Is that a fair summary? I think that's a fair summary. I think the only other discussion, and I don't know that there's consensus around it, would be uh, to to push the 2021-2022 to two years. Um, and so is there uh, any general support of, about that? Uh, if not, then uh, I, I would call a vote on the, the current. I'm sorry, Peter, can you rephrase the question again? Yeah, that's fair. Um, if we look at this recommendation, uh, the only potential modification would be to take bullet point three and extend the 2021-2022 delay for two years rather than one. I haven't heard uh, sort of consensus around that potential adjustment. And so uh, would open up the group uh, for comments about that. Uh, if there's not a uh, concerted uh, support of that, then I would uh, propose recommendation as listed. Peter, and, I would support that recommendation. It's Angela Dowling. Sorry, and, I didn't raise my hand. Thank, thank you, Angela. Yeah, I struggle with the hand raise thing too. Um, uh, and when you say you support that recommendation, is that for the two-year extension or for the, the OHA recommendation as listed here? The two-year extension. Thank you. Any other comments about that, Mary Beth? Your hands up. Yeah. Can you just repeat? I'm sorry, I must have missed it. But like, what the um, rationale is for delaying it two years instead of one? I think the rationale is really that uh, well, we saw some of the inflationary impacts uh, enter 2022. A lot of them are being delayed to 2023 because of the way that annualized contracts work. So uh, well, well, the provider system had some significant impacts in cost, they didn't have the opportunity to revise contracts and pass those costs on ultimately to members uh, uh, until a 2023 renegotiation. So I do think that we can expect um, some of those impacts to flow over the course of two years rather than all be immediate in 2022. The only comment I would offer, and I'm okay with this, I think, but um, the financial penalties is still within that five-year period. So that would still be including the, these two years, even if we delay the PIPs. Um, so I don't know how that would affect things from the, the payer provider organization side, but I just wanted to throw that out there. Sarah, would you flip to that slide uh, on? Um, yeah, Gerandi, let's go back to the to the table right. slide. Um, and I think I would, in this, for the sake of time, Peter, I might propose that um, we the committee take action on the recommendation as currently stated, and we can come back and have a separate discussion about whether or not the timeline for financial penalty also shifts. Um, so the and the context here is the financial penalty begins in year five, where we would look back at whether or not a payer or provider organization exceeded the cost growth target without a good reason. So any macroeconomic factors would be a good reason, but without a good reason in any three of those five years. So we need a five-year rolling window. Um, and so the 20, 
um, 21, 22, 23, all of those years would be part of that five-year rolling window. So we could say that's okay, and we've got several outs already, several off-ramps where macroeconomic factors are taken into account, and so it's unlikely that those years would count against anyone. Or we could have a separate conversation about whether or not that five-year rolling window should also be shifted out by two years. And I would postpone that part of the conversation until um, the March meeting, if that makes sense to you all. I think that's fair. Um, so let's let's call the question. Um, I'm not sure I've gotten consensus or not if we're um, uh, on a two-year period or a three-year period. So why don't we vote uh, first on the uh, two-year period? If that fails, we'll come back to the one-year period. Sarah, does that make sense to you? Sure. So I rewrote the recommendation in the chat um, for that third bullet. So OHA would, would not put a payer, a provider organization on a performance improvement plan for 2021-2022 cost growth or 2022-23 cost growth which effectively delays accountability by two years with an optional opt-in private PIP process, TBD. TBD. Um, Andrew, your thoughts? Thanks, just before voting, so it sounds like we're gonna vote on the recommendation as revised with a two-year delay. Just a discussion on that before the vote. Say, I, I, I'd probably prefer to, have a one year since we can revisit this every single year you know my, my preference would be to to just make a one year change to what we're doing and then continue to revisit that so uh that's probably where i'll vote on this I appreciate that other thoughts Let's go through the vote on the revised uh, approach. Uh, I think by raising hands, uh, would you flip to the um, the recommendation, recognizing that you've modified it for these purposes? And uh, there we go. And you've got your chat up there as well. Um, so what we're, we're voting on is keep the growth, cost growth target value at the 3.4%, keep macroeconomic factors on a list of good reasons. OHA would not put any pair provider organization on a, let's call it a formal PIP for 21 through 23. Um, and, uh, let's, let's just get some sense of the board's uh, approval of that, recognizing um, that I don't know that we have consensus on. So uh, all in favor of the modified? I don't know, Sarah, do we have a way of doing that formally? We don't. I think our charter is focusing more, our, our guidance is more for a consensus decision. So maybe if we have any concerns or objections, if anyone can't live with, can't live with this proposal, we should Figure that out before could, doing an official vote. Yeah, count. that's great. And 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 uh, I, I I apologize for not knowing sort of the process of an advisory committee. Um, uh, you know, Andrew has has expressed his his interest in keeping to the original OHA recommendation. Angela expressed um, some of the concerns that I've outlined uh, of uh, 2023. Other comments by the board, Gil. Yeah, I, I was just um, uh, reflecting on some earlier comments about, you know, having the data drive our decisions. And, you know, I, although um, we could probably um, uh, suspect that that uh, the, uh, the, the following years going to be impacted um, quite a bit from these macroeconomics, we don't have the data just yet. Uh, so it's um, just in keeping with that principle, probably um, more um, comfortable with just the, the one year uh, at this point, and then uh, revisiting once we have um, more, more data to, to help with our decision-making. Thank you, that's, that's very helpful. Uh, Felisa and then Greg. I would just echo, the, I echo Andrew and Gil. Thank you, Greg. 
Uh, yeah, I more or less would, would echo uh, those thoughts as well. And I just, I, I, in general, I think, I think that, you know, the minor inconvenience of, of having to have this conversation again and, and hold another vote at perhaps a year from now um, is, is outweighed, I think, by the, by the kind of significance of, um, of extending the, the, the period a year out, perhaps, maybe, even though we think that we will, you know, there's a good chance we will have to do it again. But I think that having the opportunity to look at the data and really make the most considered assessment that we can before we make that decision is, is um, worth, our, worth our time. That's very thoughtful. Thank you, Jim. Uh, in the interest of brevity, uh, I, I, I could give you an uh, explanation, but I'd be in favor of the one year uh, as well. Um, sounds to me like we have a broader consensus on maintaining the original OHA recommendation. Uh, maybe we just do sort of a voice consensus, Sarah, if that's the right process. Sure. Um, so uh, going back to the original recommendation that is uh posted uh all in favor say aye aye aye, aye. 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 all opposed say nay nay I, I, I think i'm the only one peter thank you angela um uh i think we have uh, general consensus sarah okay I think that seems like a decision. We will update and communicate this with payers and providers. I think the takeaways that I heard for us as staff are to um, continue to build out the macroeconomic factors um, and the reasons for that, to prepare that data conversation, to think about um, the optional PIP process and the opt-in and what that looks like, and to figure out when we are having this conversation about the second year. Um, since we will want to have this again and revisit this. So let me think about the work plan and when we'll have some of that data availability and we'll make sure that this conversation comes back to the committee about the 2022-2023 time period. Really, really appreciate the discussion today. Thank you uh, for extending some time to us, Sarah. I think we've uh, run over pretty significantly really, really important issue for, uh, for the committee to address. So thank you for your time. Shall we do a break, sir? Yeah, we are running a little bit behind schedule. So do you folks want to take five minute, six minute break, come back at 1050 and we'll get into our next topic? Sounds great. Okay. Thank Let's you. That. And there's an audio check. Felisa, whenever you're ready. Great. Uh, I think we are going to talk about our favorite topic, drugs. Um, so... <laughs> Uh, just a quick uh, reminder about um, attempting, if you can, to use the hand raise. And I know folks have a lot of comments and um, chats about drugs, uh, prescription drugs in particular. Um, and, you know, uh, Peter, people may have heard Sarah and Peter talking over the chat. I know that a lot of folks have to jump at noon, and I want to make sure that we give space to public comment. So if we can keep our comments concise and short, if you have things that we can follow up with the staff later, and then also feel free to add comments into the chat. Um, but I would like to just um, take this time to talk about the prescription drug affordability bill, which is the statutory requirement uh, to report to the Oregon Health Cost Target Growth Target Program every year. This is their report. Um, you have the report in your packet. It's also on the OHA website. If a staff person can drop that link in the chat, that would be great. It talks about price trends for prescription drugs, um, the prescription drugs affordability review, um, and recommendations on legislative changes uh, necessary to make prescription drugs and products more affordable in Oregon. This will not be the last time we talk about prescription drugs. <laughs> so um, I want to introduce Ralph Margrish, um, who is here from PDAP. And I think I butchered his last name, and I apologize for that. 
being a Felisa Hagens, I understand that can happen to people. And I'm sorry um, to talk about uh, the work that the committee is doing and the strategies that they put out for the report. So, uh, Ralph. Felisa, thank you. No problem at all. Good morning. And if we can move to the next slide. Actually, Felicia, did you need to speak to that at all, or are we good moving? I think, moving I, think I did. One? Jump ahead. Great. Thank you. So uh, I'm Ralph Magrish. It's great to be with you. I am the executive director of the Prescription Drug Affordability Board. Uh, literally just jumped over a short while ago from our concurrent Drug Affordability Board meeting that's going on right now. I bring you greetings from our board chair, Akil Patterson, and the rest of the board. Um, so great to be with you. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, what I'll do is just hit the functions of the board very briefly, and then we'll get into the substance of the recommendation. So created Senate Bill 844.21 to protect Oregonians, the state, local government, commercial health plans, healthcare providers, pharmacies, and others within the healthcare system from high cost of prescription drugs. That is a long-winded way of saying all of us. Um, to that point, um, we'll just give you context for some of the activities that the board is really primarily tasked with in addition to making recommendations. Drug affordability reviews are our primary charge, um, beginning criteria development now to, with the board to go through a rulemaking process over the next four to six months, expecting to uh, conduct and begin those drug affordability reviews late summer. Um, per statute, we are required to look at and develop a list of nine drugs and at least one insulin product. Contextually, um, we look at this as a funnel. We anticipate from seeing other work done in other states that I'll speak to that funnel starting with probably about 150 drugs as it makes its way through the criteria that get memorialized in rule. Um, we will see which drugs remain left in that universe for affordability reviews. Um, I did present back to you, I think back in early September as the board was ramping up its activities, uh, very pleased to come back to you with our recommendations for legislative change. As Felicia noted, we can go to the next slide. Um, as Felicia noted, we are required under statute to report to you um, as we have the legislature with our findings. And we can go to the next slide, please. So uh, just a couple things before we get started, and I'll run through each of these recommendations with you. Um, as noted, we got a late start in 2022. So as such, the board's recommendations on issues that we thought to be the most important, we evaluated varied approaches to policy issues and chose to make what we believe to be smart, measured, and progressive recommendations for our first year in existence. Um, also, very pleased to share with you some pretty late breaking news uh, that we're, we're very proud that Senator Deb Patterson, the chair of the Senate Health Care Committee, will be introducing a bill as the lead sponsor in the coming weeks that will include all of our PDAB recommendations for 2022. So super excited about that. Um, then the last thing that I will say before we jump into this is that as our team has come to say, we see drug affordability as a health equity issue, full stop, period, exclamation point. Uh, that's kind of our, our thing that we like to say, full stop, exclamation point. We see drug affordability as a health equity issue. It is one of our North Stars. Um, as I dive into this, what I will do in the interest of time is pause after each recommendation. I'd like to take clarifying questions if there are any, and then we'll have ample opportunity for broader discussion. So uh, just running right across here, first one to implement upper payment limits for government payers. Gironde, if we can, we'll just jump right into that slide specifically. Thank you. Uh, we've got this deck set up as kind of current status quo and recommendations. So to that point, the legislature did propose upper payment limits in the original bill language back in 2021 in Senate Bill 844 to establish upper payment limits for all sales and reimbursement claims in the state of Oregon. That language was ultimately removed. Right now, the board really can only track and study the rate setting efforts going on in other states. Primarily the two states that have a, a bit of a head start on us are both Maryland and Colorado. 
Um, the PDAB recommendation itself is to grant authority for the board to set up repayment limits for state and local government purchasers for drugs for which the board has conducted affordability reviews on. Uh, just to give you a little bit of context, as I said, those two states being Maryland and Colorado, Maryland is limited in its authority to set upper payment limits for government payers. Colorado has statutory authority now to implement for both commercial and government payers. One of the footnotes around Colorado is that they're using a templated savings report that will be memorialized in rule for commercial carriers what they are calling a carrier use of savings report. That is how our carriers going to use those savings uh, realized from the ceiling that would be set by an upper payment limit. I'll manage through their State Department of Insurance. Again, circling back that this is our first year out with, I, I mentioned earlier, kind of smart, measured, and progressive. We thought appropriate in our first year that knowing change is incremental that more likely appropriate that the board start out with a recommendation for government payers. Uh, we'll note that that recommendation to set those payment limits for government payers, we're speaking about state county correctional facilities, state hospital, health clinics at state institutions of higher learning and drugs paid for through the health benefit plan of a state or local government. Um, and then, of course, the flexibility to amend or suspend that upper payment limit if there are drug shortages. There have been quite a lot of news uh, in more recent days about the availability of certain drugs in the supply chain. Um, so, so recognizing that flexibility. Um, we'll just say a couple other things before I pause to take questions. Um, intuitively, as folks will ask the question, so, so what kind of money can you save for us if the legislature is to grant authority for us to do that. Um, that is an unknown, obviously, for a number of independent variables and dependent variables. I can tell you that we are pulling together a modeling team now to discuss this with colleagues at PEB and OAB. Um, as you can imagine, lots of variables, as we said. Um, so more to come on that, contemplating what some benchmarks and proxies might be for that. Um, and of course, a couple obvious pieces in that, um, speaking to the Medicaid uh, drug purchasing under federal law, net of rebate, Medicaid already does get the lowest price available. And then recognizing that throughout uh, units of government, there are some entities that are 340B covered entities owned and operated by county health clinics that purchasing drugs at 340B are going to get that next to the lowest possible purchase or acquisition price anyway. So con contemplating what some of those might look like in a model. Um, happy to pause now and take any questions on this. And again, if we can just keep those to contextual or informational and then happy to open for broader, more substantive policy questions after. Uh, does anyone have clarifying questions? No. Okay. And next slide, please. Hey, Ralph. I'm yes. oh, sorry. It took me a second to get off mute. You know, as you think about setting up or payment limits for particular drugs, is there a concern the industry doesn't make those drugs available to government purchasers at the accepted price or the, the upper limit price? I think that if I can, Peter, you're not the first person to ask that question. I think these are all largely TBDs. I don't say that to punt, um, but I say that in the context that we, we live in a very dynamic marketplace. And for many drugs, there are uh, multi-source generic alternatives or co-licensed or branded alternatives. So it is to say, if one manufacturer were to not offer its products, there would be other products of equal therapeutic value available in the supply chain in Oregon, perhaps at yet a lower price on top of that. So, and I think, uh, Dronde, if we can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So uh, this is about transparency in the supply chain, specifically around rebates for pharmacy benefit managers and group purchasing organizations. 
Again, currently set up limited transparency in the supply chain, and we recognize that rebates and payments influence the price of drugs at the pharmacy counter uh, and how those uh, dollars flow through insurance premiums in unknown ways. Uh, so to that point, this would require PBMs and group purchasing organizations, which are either used or owned by PBMs, to operate rebate programs to report aggregated rebates and other payments from manufacturers annually to the drug price transparency program for which we would post. Uh, specifically on these, it would require PBMs and GPOs to provide us with aggregated dollar amounts of rebates, fees, price protections, payments, and any other payments that are received from manufacturers relating to the administration of the pharmacy benefit for insurance carriers in the state. It would require them to report aggregated dollar amounts of fees, rebates, price protections, and any other, any other pieces that are received from the manufacturer and how in fact those are passed on to carriers, whether they are passed on to enrollees at the point of sale or retained as revenue. So a, a lot of this is in the spirit and context of we don't know what we don't know. This is to inform, inform and illuminate public policy um, recommendations by the board and decisions ultimately by the legislature. Uh, I see that you did have a legislative update earlier in the presentation as we did at our meeting as well. I know there is a bill out there, I believe from Representative Nathanson that is similar to this, but does provide a couple additional layers on that. On top of what we have that would also include um, reporting of de-identified pharmacy claims level information so that we could do more rigorous and robust uh, analysis if in fact that bill were to pass, but again that is separate from board recommendations. I will pause right here and see if there are any questions on this before we move along. I think seeing none, Jaronde, if you would. Thank you. Uh, so recommendation number three, expanding reporting requirements to patient assistance programs. Again, set up as currently only drugs subject to price increase reporting requirements through the drug price transparency program must also report patient assistance program information the board recommends removing that requirement for reporting from the price increase reports and requiring all manufacturers to report annually on all patient assistance programs that they maintain. Again, that being limited strictly to price increases creates a pretty narrow line of vision or view. Um, I suspect that any or all of you may only need to tone on your television, your radio, your streaming news media outlet, whatever it might be. And uh, it strong likelihood that at some point during that time, you would be inundated with uh, drug commercials that are concluded by after the litany of side effects, some pleasant, some not, there is likely some additional language in that uh, if you are unable to afford your medication, assistance may be available. A lot of this, as noted, is really uh, to inform good public policy. Um, and again, noting that this will help the legislature understand the role of patient assistance programs and copay accumulators in developing future policies. I will pause here and see if there are any questions. All right, and Gironde, if you would, please. So uh, again, recommendation number four, reporting to expand reporting requirements for more insurers to the drug price transparency program housed at DCBS. Uh, currently, carriers are required to submit rate filings only if they're individual or small group benefit health benefit plans. Under House Bill 4005, they created the Drug Price Transparency Program. These plans are required to report spending on prescription drugs at the time of the rate filing. Some commercially insured plans do not participate in these markets, are not required to submit spend reports. This results likely in incomplete data and pictures of drug spends for us. And to improve both the legislative and DCBS understanding of carrier spending on prescription drugs, this proposal is to separate the rate filing and the drug spend reporting process and expand drug spending reporting to all state regulated insurance carriers. 
Again, contextually, we don't know what we don't know, and we would like to get this information to inform future public policy. And I can pause right there. Sarah, go ahead. Thanks. I want to just provide a little context um, to bring some of this together. So in the cost growth target program, we do collect pharmacy spending. So the amounts in aggregate of dollars that payers pay out to providers in claims and non-claims based payments. We do collect pharmacy spending as a category and we collect that net and gross of pharmacy rebates. So that's something that we're in contact with Ralph's program on and we're looking at sharing information back and forth. Um, we don't have a lot of this granularity if any of this granularity on the cost growth target program side either. So just wanting to add that um, these expanded reporting recommendations are really complementary to what we're collecting and let us really have more insight into how rebates are applied and where they're applied when we're looking at the overall pharmacy spending. Um, and this is just related to all of the overall um, pharmacy data collection that we're doing as state agencies. Thank you. And I think, Gerande, we can go to the final recommendation. I, oh, it. Felicia, go ahead. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> Ralph. I just want to give, I know that this uh, recommendation number four overlaps with DCBS, so I just wanted to give Andrew a chance if he wanted to add anything. I was looking for my buttons. Uh, no, I mean, no, nothing to add. You're right, there, there's some overlap. Ralph and his team sit within DCBS. He also helps oversee uh, the uh, the other transparency program. There's great collaboration uh, between the two programs. So not, nothing really else to add. Great, thanks. Sorry, go ahead, Ralph. Oh, not a problem. Thank you both. Uh, so recommendation number five, this is to require patient advocacy organizations to disclose funding, publicly disclose funding sources. This is specific to drug affordability board meetings and testimony and public comment. When we begin and conduct our actual affordability reviews based on work that we've seen in the two other states that are farther along in their maturity curve, we expect a, a, a large number of patient advocacy groups to come present and testify and offer public comment. We lack the statutory authority to uh, require those groups to disclose their industry funding sources. We believe that that disclosure of financial ties and those potential influences is important to provide a transparent background for PDAB decisions. To that point, the board recommends that advocacy groups disclose their industry funding sources, and you can read there what all of those elements might be. Again, noting as we kick off these affordability reviews on the nine drugs and an insulin product later late this summer, we do expect a significant amount of testimony and input from patient advocacy groups. And in the spirit of importance and transparency, we believe that this is very important so uh, to be included in this process. Um, that is our recommendation set and happy to move to discussion or take additional questions on any of these. Okay, so before uh, we go, that was like lightning speed drugs. <laughs> so, and by the way, I cannot resist making drug puns, so I will continue to do that throughout the rest of this presentation. Um, before we head on, I just want to talk about what we need to do here, because I think that that actually might inform some of the questions that people have. So, I think the first, you know, one of the questions we have are there additional recommendations that people want. Um, I think the other piece is we can make a decision that we, we have to accept and endorse the report, or we can just accept the report and we don't have to endorse the report. <laughs> um, and they will, we can take some of the recommendations, but not all of the recommendations. Um, oh, good. There's a little slide up with the decision points. So there's going to be a lot of um, components here on this decision making. And so the model that I'd like to offer is that we'll have some discussion, um, make sure that our questions get answered. We'll move forward with the recommendation. And then what I'd like to do is the way I'd like to run this is if you have an objection to moving forward on something, then I'd like to dig into that a little bit more if that works for people. So uh, let's open it up for questions. Felisa, can I add just one more piece of context to that? Um, 
in terms of why we're asking the advisory committee to formally accept the report, the Prescription Drug Affordability Board is statutorily required to report their recommendations to the cost growth target program. So we thought that this advisory committee was the place to do that. So we wanted to have a formal recognition of that happening. So when we're saying accept, that's what that's what we're talking about. Thank you. Kardesh, I thought you'd come off mute. Do you have something to add? Yeah, I, I was going to. Uh, I, I, I didn't, Ralph, I didn't see any numbers. I mean, do you have any uh, just expected impacts of this or, uh, you know, or how big is this uh, red basket here? Sure. So, Kardesh, uh, as, as noted, truly hard to model. Um, and again, in the context that the board just approved these uh, the week prior to Christmas, we are pulling together a team of analysts at, at PEP and OEB to do some um, kind of model development. I mean, I would tell you that I can't even use drugs that would be identified for the Inflation Reduction Act as a surrogate or, or proxy. At this point, those won't be available until I believe September. And to that point, I would speculate that those drugs will be based on demographics of a Part D population, likely a different case mix and utilization than an overall population. Um, so I do not have numbers, but we are working on that. Um, have been very transparent with folks throughout this that I would anticipate this being an indeterminate fiscal at this point, um, but we will be doing some work on that, but nothing I can share at this point. Okay, it'd be great to get something, even if it's in future to understand this. Sure. Other additions or questions? Stefan? Uh, yeah, I, I guess um, I guess my question is, you know, um, uh, your uh, your objective here, purpose was to protect Oregonians uh, and others from high cost of prescription drugs. I'm not an expert on prescription drugs, so I can't really speak to this. I look at these recommendations. Um, I was just going to get your sense whether this is making um, uh, good progress on that objective. Um, and the really service strongest recommendations you can uh, you can furnish for this uh, for this purpose. Stephen, can I ask you to repeat just the last part of that? Kind of. Yeah, so maybe you think that your recommendations here, so I'm not an expert on this kind of uh, prescription drug, um, and I'm just wondering whether you think that these recommendations that you put together here um, are, you know, conducive or uh, provide some sort of like the highest, uh, the strongest way to move forward with your purpose, which is sure, uh, I, to pr protect people from high prescription drugs. Sure, I, I do, and again, I'll circle back to something I, I said earlier in that it was important for the board, I believe, in its first year to make measured recommendations. You'll find that a number of these are ex about simply expanding data collection to better understand the landscape and the marketplace. Uh, no intention to come on like gangbusters and try to upend the entirety of the pharmaceutical supply chain in our first year of operation. Again, circling back to smart and measured, and that is to create policies and reporting requirements that can inform legislators as policymakers. Um, to the point of upper payment limits, I, I will note that there are uh, four or five other states that since we started our program have passed enabling legislation um, to create and stand up drug affordability boards. Uh, I believe there's a national movement towards this. I believe that generally speaking, the, the citizens of our state and many other places are, are kind of had enough with the opacity or the opaqueness of the supply chain and wanting to better understand what it looks like and that these are, again, smart and measured ways to do that. Um, so I think we're headed in the right direction in an intelligent way. Hey. So I'm gonna, um, are there, if there are no other additions, I'm gonna kind of start to run us through a little bit of these um, decision-making points. And then I actually think we can come, cause we have another discussion that I'd like to have. So the first decision-making point is, does the prof 
the cost growth target advisory committee, that is us, accept the prescription affordability board report. So this is just, did we all hear the report? Did we get the information? <laughs> did Ralph send us the report? So is there anyone who would like to object that they did not get the report? Okay, I think we have consensus that we got the report. So are you on that, Sarah? <laughs> you can report away. I think the next question is a little bit more of a discussion question. So there's the accepting of the report, and then there is making a uh, endorsement of the affordability uh, board's recommendations. Um, and I want to encourage people to sort of think. I think that you we get chosen based on committees not necessarily based on expertise, but on our own experiences as well. And so we should think about this not as we have to carry this work. Ralph and uh, the PDAP board will carry the work. They'll be the, they'll be the continuing expert on this along with the work in DCBS. What we have to say is, I think as a board, the decision and the discussion point we're having right now is, do we think that this is a big enough problem for us to achieve the goals that we're trying to achieve that we should say, yes, that this board, we want to endorse and support this board's work to meet our outcomes. I think that's really, and Sarah, you should jump in here if I'm asking the wrong question. Peter, you too. But I think that's the question we're really asking ourselves here. I just would add one more point. I think as part of our broader work in 2023, we want to be identifying opportunities and selecting strategies for cost growth mitigation. So this set of recommendations from the Prescription Drug Affordability Board is a jump start on that list. Do we think that these opportunities are cost growth mitigation strategies and would we want to sort of fold them into our overall um, set of strategies and recommendations moving forward? So I'd like to open it up for a discussion on that and hear people's thoughts about if right track, no, we're gonna accept the report and move on. Mary Beth. Um, I just wanted to call back to the report that this group uh, has in the cost growth target program has done about um, cost growth between 2013 and 2019 in Oregon, which indicated that prescription drugs was one of the fastest growing sectors of healthcare spending. Um, and I think that that's reflected in that report. I think it's reflected in these recommendations that we need to know where that spending is coming from within um, the pharmaceutical industry. And so I think that these recommendations start to get at that um, and will provide some really good information for us moving forward. Great. Other thoughts? Shannon, I wonder if you have thoughts you want to jump in. say thank you. Um, you know, what I was sitting here kind of contemplating or thinking is it, this really uh, does a good job on affordability, but uh, is it important to note kind of how difficult it is for consumers and how affordability can vary like dramatically in the full report it listed out. I mean, a consumer can have 15 different places they could get their prescriptions at and how often is it the consumer who actually needs it gets the prescription at the right place at the right time through the right, you know, loop that they had to jump through. Um, no, that's, yeah, that's what I was thinking. And if that's relevant, I guess, to this uh, report and to this work. Yeah, very much so, yeah. Great. Uh, any other, other thoughts? Angela? The only thing I was going to uh, say is uh, basically echoing what Mary Beth said, and that is pharmaceutical costs are increasing at a faster rate than general medical inflation. And so if we don't address pharmacy or prescription costs, uh, we leave um, a big portion of healthcare spend on the table. So I support this is all I was going to say, Felisa. Great. Okay, so I'm, I, I'm going to make an assumption that people are sort of staring at me blankly because they're like, why wouldn't we endorse this? <laughs> so <laughs> if, uh, and that's kind of what I'm hearing, but I want to give people an opportunity to jump into if they're like, we, we shouldn't do that for any reason at all. Please uh, raise your, your voice now and we can take a minute. So, and talk about 
whether or not this is the right decision. So is there anybody who doesn't meet the consensus standard and wants to have a hold on making an endorsement of these proposals? Okay, uh, hearing no objections, I think that we're gonna move forward with a, a consensus recommendation that uh, we're gonna endorse these proposals. Um, so we've accepted the report and we've endorsed the proposals. And then the next item on the agenda that we have a little bit of time for, I wanna remind people if there are public comments uh, to chat Sarah, or I guess you can come off mute and just interrupt me and um, and say that you'd like to make a public comment and we'll get you on the list or raise your hand. Um, are there other, the other piece I think that we would like to discuss is um, how should the committee continue? Ralph? Mm -hmm. Felicia, first I wanna thank the advisory committee for the vote and the, the endorsement and time and opportunity. Uh, appreciate very much and look forward to working with you and I'm gonna excuse myself and get back to our board meeting. Thank you again so much. <laughs> thank you, Ralph. Thanks for sure. jumping over here. <laughs> Okay, next time Ralph comes on, we'll learn what pet he has. But right now, um, <laughs> the, are there other ideas that people have or recommendations that we wanna think about how we continue this conversation around pharmaceutical costs? Um, I believe Sarah, it, it is on the work plan. Can you describe a little bit about where that is at? Yeah, so, if you remember back to our September meeting, we went through a pretty long menu of different state and federal strategies um, to address prescription drug costs and pharmacy spend, um, recognizing that there, it's a very complicated system and there's lots of opportunities and inputs and places where intervention could happen. Um, the Prescription Drug Affordability Board recommendations are part of that, but there are also a lot of other things that could be on the table. I think my sense from the committee meeting in September um, is that we want to continue to explore this conversation and potentially recommend some additional strategies that would specifically address prescription drug costs, and that would be part of the committee's recommendations. Um, I want to just a little context for what a recommendation could be. This could be recommendations to the agencies, to OHA and DCBS about additional work that the agencies could pursue. They could be market specific. They could be Medicaid commercial specific. Um, maybe we have a little less opportunity on the Medicare side here, but thinking about where we have opportunities. Some of those recommendations could be legislative. We think the state should do X. Um, those could be recommendations that we make up to the legislature. They could be recommendations that we make up to the Oregon Health Policy Board. So there's a variety of ways that this could move forward, but I think we wanted to pause here and say, we've had a lot of information brought to the committee over the last couple of meetings. We have time on the work plan to continue this conversation but with the end goal of we would probably like to get to something that we say, yes, as a committee, we recommend these two strategies. We think they're gonna be really helpful for addressing pharmacy costs. Um, and we'd like to see them move forward in the state in some capacity. So I think that's the end goal. We can revisit that if that's not actually the end goal, but I think we wanna make space in this meeting and the next couple of meetings to continue a conversation about what strategies we think might be most effective, that we think might be most appropriate for Oregon, um, and then figure out where that lives, whether that's agency work, legislative work, or something else. Does that help? So I think, I, you know, I think that this is a, it, there's gonna be a set of questions that come along based on the presentation. And so do folks have strong feelings about how we how we continue this conversation is it helpful for us to br bring recommendations here and then give space for us to come up with additional recommendations what is it helpful that this the maybe one of the oha staff can sort of survey our committee and do a quick what are your general thoughts there may be other people in your organization that work on this or think about this in a more in-depth way I really like the idea of a quick strat of a quick survey, Felisa. I, I think we could absolutely take that list of possible strategies from September and send out a quick survey to all committee members um, after this meeting and use that to shape the March agenda 
we'd essentially look for which strategies are you know you most interested in continuing to explore and move forward and then we can provide a refresher on them and have more more in-depth discussion in March in March yeah I, yeah thanks uh Felicia I, I I you know again uh, I agree that you know drug is a huge part of the healthcare cost and and I don't think we need to you know it, it can be excluded we have to if we need to change a healthcare cost you need to address the drug cost right so but again it, not being an expert in how this large industry works um you know and and it's been multiple years where you know this has been an issue right so but I I would really like to see Again, there's a couple of things, right? One is the drug utilization side. Somebody alluded to that. How do we make sure that the drugs are prescribed, not over-prescribed? Again, we are in a volume-based reimbursement. More, more prescriptions means more money. And then the other is the price side, you know, which is uh, there is heavy incentives to really pay high price for drugs. And again, it's complex. But I, but I, I, you know, I do support that we should probably keep an eye on this and provide our collective expertise on what could we do to help enhance this work because I think there's there's a, there, there is this huge opportunity opportunity over here both on the utilization side and the price side. So. I'm going to recommend, I think that Sarah, that you, it would be helpful for folk, for you to send out a survey, the OHA to send out a survey on those strategies that came up at the last meeting. The other thing that I would, I want to encourage board members to do is to move that survey outside of the board to hear from some of your core partners in this work. I know that many of your organizations have people dedicated to trying to figure out how they reduce their costs of prescription drugs or prescription drug util utilization. Um, and I also think, you know, there's a lot of challenges, I think, both on the consumer side as well, that I think would be important to hear from, as well as the payer side and the provider side on how we're interacting with all of these different components, as, as Hardesh said, of a very large and massive industry. And so I think if we could get that survey out and spend a couple of, maybe a couple of weeks, a little bit longer to allow people to do sort of a broader crowdsourcing of ideas um, and thoughts on those strategies, I think that that might be helpful. Do people feel like, do people feel like they can commit to helping move that out or push that out? Peter? Yeah, I think that's a really good idea to to reach out and in our various organizations. Uh, we may have some subject matter experts. Um, Sarah, I also think that we might uh, consider how we bring in some subject matter experts um, to give us opportunity to get as specific enough to make a recommendation um, that's actionable. And I think that um, as we listen to to folks talk, we can think about the structural problems in the system that have enabled drug prices to grow at the level that they have. Um, we can think about the new technologies, the, the new uh, offerings that have also done that. So it's not all structural problems. But to get down to a level that is actually going to mitigate cost, I think is going to take some expertise that uh, certainly I don't have. Great point, Peter. And I think Sarah said that Sarah's committed to experts in the chat. Uh, and I know Julie had to Julie had to jump, but I, I think Katie is still on. And so it would, I think it would be very good to hear also from some large self-insurers who've tried to take on this issue within their own plans, um, who are often outside of sort of the current reporting structures. So it's gonna flag that. Thank you. I I have a meeting with my health policy committee next week, so we can bring that up. Perfect. Thank you, Katie. Mm -hmm. That's great. Okay. Are there other comments or thoughts or ideas that we should be implementing on this topic area? 
okay, if not, I I feel terrible that I drove Ralph's time. Like <laughs> nobody's business, and now we're gonna wrap up early. So nobody tell him. Um, <laughs> I think that uh, we do not have any public comments. I want to make sure that we have um, just if there's anybody who wants to jump in, please. Now is your time. And the second piece of the conversation is I want to remind people our next meeting is March 15th from 9 a.m. to noon. And also um, uh, the committee, and Sarah just posted, the committee did receive written comments from the Oregon Association of Hospitals and Health Systems. Please take a look and read those comments. I think that they're uh, particularly relate to our earlier conversation. Um, so please take a look at those. Um, and as always, I feel like if there are agenda items or other items that you'd like to bring forward on this agenda uh, or feedback uh, for myself or Peter on facilitation, um, please get that to us uh, where I'm always in a, I try to be in a constant learning environment. So, um, and we wanna make sure that this is a good use of our time and we're moving forward on our agenda together. Sarah, Peter, do you have anything else to add? I just echo your your comments and would really appreciate any additional um, identification of uh, agenda items and or how we could facilitate this meeting more effectively. And just a recognition that we had a very full agenda today and not only did we get through it all and made a bunch of decisions, we are also going to end early. I think that some excellent facilitation and discussion from everybody. So thank you so much for your participation. Okay, well, I look forward to seeing you all uh, on the Zooms in March and maybe someday in person. <laughs> Thanks all.